All right, so it's been uh, two weeks. We had a little bit of a uh, pause there just because of the uh, uh, Resurrection Day Easter um, message that I gave last week. So I'm going to have to review a little bit for those of you who uh, either weren't here at all or, uh, or have had two weeks of not listening to me at all. So let me review a little bit. Starting out in, uh, in Isaiah chapter 2, verse 5. Isaiah chapter 2, verse 5, and I'll start in the New King James Version just to make this a little easier, uh, where it says, O house of Jacob, come and let us walk in the light of the Lord, for you have forsaken your people, the house of Judah, because they are filled with eastern ways, they are soothsayers like the Philistines, and they are pleased with the children of foreigners. Which is okay. Uh, the translation that I have written which I believe uh, is a little bit more comprehensive, starting in verse 5, and I'll go to the thought for thought uh, part of this. House of Jacob, come, and we have come in the light of Hashem, for you forsook your people, house of Jacob, because they filled themselves from the east with eastern philosophies and observers of omens, those who established truth on the basis of experiences, like the Philistines and the children of foreigners. That's the end of verse 6. Now, there were a couple of things that I had mentioned previously. I'll review them just for a minute in order to uh, transition into verse, uh, verse 8 and beyond. Uh, the first thing is, is that there are people who will take this position that uh, the day is coming when we'll have the right king. Uh, a couple weeks ago, I talked about uh, having the right law, but you don't necessarily have the right king. And then uh, two weeks ago, I talked about having the right law and the right king when the Lord Jesus will him, himself personally uh, come and administrate his law from the mountain there at Mount Zion or Jerusalem in that remote proximity. It will be a place in the midst of the tops of the mountains that are in that geography. It doesn't mean that he has to change the geography. It will just be somewhere around there where he will resolve the national or international conflicts that take place. So there's an expectation that there will still be individual nations, but instead of uh, 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 engaging with each other in war, they will go and resolve their conflicts by going to see him. He will explain to them what the law is, and they will go and execute the law. There will be uh, uh, internal problems on an individual level, which means that sin is not going to go away. There's still going to be sin, because if he's going to have to correct people, if he's going to talk with people about the paths that they need to walk in, if he's going to reprove individuals, and there has to be sin, there has to be people walking in the wrong paths, there has to be conflict for him to administrate the law. This is something that tends to be overlooked for some reason, and I just wanted to mention that. So what, what will people do sometimes in order to suggest that we need to live under the law? What they'll do is they'll say, look, you see, the day is coming when we're going to have the right king and the right law, and so we might as well get used to it now. Which is, which is effectively communicated here when he speaks to house of Jacob. You know, come now. I mean, if it's going to happen in the future, let's just get used to it. Right? And then people will say, you know, in the future, we're going to be following the right law with the right king, and so let's get used to it now. You know, if everybody's got to go and observe the Feast of Tabernacles or observe the Passover, then let's just get used to it now. Let's just do it now. If we're going to be observing the Sabbath law, then let's just do it now. You know, get used to it. Because that is what he says here in Isaiah chapter 2, verses 5 and, and 6. That, that's a, 6 and 7. That's effectively what he, he says. If we're, going to, if, if we're going to do that in the future, then let's get used to doing it now. But... But when people say that today, when they say that today, what they're saying is that we need to return to the law now, and they believe that the reason why is because we'll be able to get our sin under control, we'll get our flesh under control by the reduction of sin, and we'll be right with God because we'll be observing His law. Okay, But in order to do that, you have to reject what Jesus accomplished. You have to reject the complete forgiveness of sins, you have to reject the inheritance that we have in Christ. You know, all those things that he accomplished because he set us free from the law, you have to reject those things. Now, this is easy to do if you don't know what those things are. All right? It's easy to do. 
Because you don't know what you're turning away from. And that's what I hear when I hear people say, we must return to the right law with the expectation that one day we'll get the right king and do it now. The reason why they do that is because they don't know what the new covenant is. And they do not know the king of kings in the context of the Messiah and what he's already accomplished. And so it's an easy transition for people to go into. And when they level condemnation on you because you're not going in this direction, do not fear them. All right, don't be afraid. Just recognize that these are people who don't know any better. All right, they don't know any better. Now, <clears throat> let me go back to the historical context of when this was written. He says, O house of Jacob, you have failed. Right? You failed to do this with your people. And so we have a division in the people. We have a division in the context of the house of Jacob, which in this case would be those who are somewhat pursuing a life under the law. And you've got the rest of the people in Israel who are not, who are being officially recognized as, as uh, the Philistines. Okay? That, that's effectively what's happened. And those who are embracing Eastern philosophies, okay, they, they become recognized as people who are strangers and foreigners, people who don't belong there, as I mentioned from uh, chapter 1. People who don't belong there. Now, those of the house of Jacob who are failing to live in, a, in complete observance to the law don't belong there either by definition because they have failed to live in, a, in, in obedience to all the commandments. But at least he can address the people who are at least giving it some kind of an effort, and that's what he's doing. He's addressing those people, recognizing them as the house of Jacob. At least you're giving some kind of an effort for yourselves, but you have failed to spread the good news of the law to everybody else, and so they're turning to Eastern philosophies and other things. The observers of omens, establishing truth on the basis of an experience as opposed to establishing truth on the basis of what God declared already. So that's what I was explaining in the previous weeks. <clears throat> now, he calls the people to return to the law because he's going to invoke the law in the future. So turn to the law so that you can at least get used to it. But again, when people attempt to live a life under the law, they will fail. And when they fail, God is disgusted with them. All right? God is disgusted with He does not accept them. He does not love them. And they will live in the condemnation that they will rightfully have because of their failure to live in observance and in obedience to His commandments. And so what can they do? They can try harder. Or they can just stay where they are, where they are and hope that one day they die and God will resolve these things in the future. That's the most that they can hope for. And that's the purpose of it. When the call comes again for people to return to the law in the future, when we get the right king who has the right law, that call will be to get people to do it again, which will lead to failure again. So this belief that people have that we just need to do it now so we can get used to it because we're going to do it later, this belief that people have will lead them to failure. It will lead them to condemnation. The condemnation because God is disgusted with them because they have failed to observe all of the commandments. Right? So this is what they don't tell you. People won't tell you that they're going to fail because they don't want to believe that. That's why it becomes appealing. It becomes attractive because there's a suggestion that we can, we can actually succeed. We can get used to it. And so when the Messiah comes, we will be ready for Him because we will already be used to you know, living according to the law anyway, which is a total lie. You're not going to be doing it. All right? So that's, that's where this ends in failure. So this is what people do, right? And we've got a lot of people right now who are teaching this. It seems to, to be a popular topic. Um, we've got a lot of people who uh, have a Jewish background of some kind, which in my opinion consists of very little more than, oh yeah, I'm Jewish, and then they go around saying that they're Jewish Christians. And they might legitimately be so, but they have really no history in the synagogue at all. They have no history in Pharisaical Judaism personally, beyond the fact that maybe their grandfather was a rabbi at best, something like that. But you know, people look at these and these people who call themselves um, rabbis, Jewish Christians, or something, as if they're, you know, they're something. 
You know, just because they've done a few Passovers or, 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 or spun their dreidel a few times when they were a kid, and somehow that gives them some credentials. All right, but it, it's, it, don't be afraid of these people, all right? Don't be afraid of these people. These people are just simply zeros, in my opinion. All right, they really are. Even if they had these kinds of credentials, they still would be zeros, all right? Because it's nothing, nothing more than an expert in trying to live a life that you cannot live. And what is that? I mean, doesn't that sound dysfunctional? I'm an expert in being able to fail. <laughs> All right, that makes it a little bit more clear, doesn't it? So don't, don't worry about these people, but there's a big surge of this happening right now. And I've, I've, I've taken a little bit of time to get, get refreshed and updated, and I've listened to a few of these people to get their message. And so what is their message? Their message is the law. You know, the law. The law, this is the only way to be blessed by God. This is the only way to have a blessed life. You know, you've got to observe. You've got to repent. You've got to obey. And I'm going to give you more laws than what you're getting at church. That's the message now. I'm going to give you more of them than what you get at church. Because you've noticed that when you go to church, you're not being blessed like you, you know you should be getting blessed. And I'm going to tell you that the reason why is because you don't have enough law in your life. And so I'm going to give you some more. Right? Now this is where I have, a, I have an issue with these people. I have an issue with these people because they won't give enough either. Right? They won't teach enough. Okay, what they do is they, 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 they stack up the festivals, you know, the Sabbath and the dietary laws, on top of all the laws that the church is dispensing. They stack those on top of it and say, you see, here's more. And here's your way to be blessed. You just need to do this. And I'm telling you that they're not teaching enough. Okay? They don't teach enough of the law. That's where I have a problem with these people. And why I will say that when they say they are rabbis or teachers of the law, that they're liars. They're frauds. Because they won't teach the rest of it. That's why. They won't teach the rest of the law. You know, things like my, one of my favorites, Leviticus chapter 19, verse 18. Do not ever bear a grudge against anyone. Right? Don't bear a grudge. Love your neighbor as yourself. You know, they won't teach that one because that's too hard. You know, well, let's just ease into it a little bit. Learn to like the other ones, and then we'll go to those. But you'll never make it that far. So don't fear these people. They don't teach the whole of the law. And that's why I say that they're frauds, is because they won't do it all. If they would do it all, then the law would have its perfect effect of creating despair and destruction and a recognition that you are cursed by God. They won't let people have it. They won't give it to people. They only give part of it, you know, those that are easier to obey, so that people can get this, this, this sense that blessings are on their way. All right, blessings are coming because you observed more than what somebody else did. You know, that kind of a thing. They're comparing themselves with a bunch of other religious people who just don't have as many laws, and they think that they're impressive. All right, the point is, is that you have to teach the whole, the totality, all of it, so that you will eventually reach the destruction that you need to reach. And then once you reach that destruction and despair, then you can turn to the Lord for His grace and mercy according to the new covenant. You put all of that down. You put all of it aside and walk in the newness of life on the basis of forgiveness and reconciliation and that there is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus so that you can begin to walk in the newness of life on the basis of the inheritance that you have in Christ. Right? So there's your summary of everything. I'll now proceed into the next verse, uh, reading through the... Uh, this is chapter 2. I'll proceed into verse 7. I'm going to start with the New King James Version. Uh, and what I want you to try to pay attention to is the pronouns. <coughs> Alright, the pronouns in this case, we're going to be talking, I'm going to be talking about pronouns this morning. Because he's, he's using the word theirs, they, them. You know, there is no they or them in here, with the exception of one. And that is a very creatively placed they. Right. In Hebrew, we have pronouns for him, his, and theirs, and they. So we know when Isaiah is stating him, them, they, or theirs. We know that. 
Uh, and there are a lot of errors here when it comes to that. So when you see the translation that I have and you see these pronouns that are completely uh, different from the ones that they're using here, it really is on purpose. Right? It's not some kind of exaggeration of some kind. But beginning in the New King James Version, it says, their land is also full of silver and gold, and there is no end to their treasures. Their land is also full of horses, and there is no end to their chariots. Their land is also full of idols. They worship the work of their own hands, that which their own fingers have made. People bow down, and each man humbles himself. Therefore, do not forgive them. Enter, this is in verse 10, enter into the rock and hide in the dust from the terror of the Lord and the glory of His majesty. The lofty looks of, a, of man shall be humbled, the haughtiness of men shall be bowed down, and the Lord alone shall be exalted in that day. And uh, two weeks ago I mentioned that this day that the Lord will be exalted is not the day when He shows up in the tops of the mountains and the nations come to Him to receive His counsel and the law. That's not the day of exaltation. That's the day when the law is exalted, but it's not the day when God is exalted. God will be exalted in the day when people fail, even though they've got the right king and the right law, and they do their best to try to observe it. It's in the failure. It's in the destruction. It's when things collapse. That's when he'll be, He will be exalted. But the exaltation of His law will happen uh, when people actually come to listen to the law that He has to dispense. And why... Why is there a difference? There, there is a difference, and I want you to understand the difference. The difference between the exaltation of the law and the exaltation of the God, the one who needs to be exalted, is because there is this belief that all we need is the knowledge of good and evil. We only need to know what is right, what is wrong. We do what is right. We don't do that which is wrong. We just need the right law, and everything will be just fine. There's no exaltation for God in that context. There is lots of opportunity to exalt the devil in that context because he's the one who started that twisted belief. In the Garden of Eden, when he said all you need to know is what is good and evil, and you can be like God. You can be a good person. You can be a good Christian. You know, that kind of a thing. He will exalt the law, not to exalt himself. He will exalt the law so that people will finally follow it. They will then collapse under the condemnation of it. And then he'll be exalted because he can say, you see, it doesn't work. It doesn't work. Just because you know what is good, you know what is evil, just because you know what you're supposed to be doing, and you do it, it still won't work. It won't change a person's heart. Through that, they will not know the person of their God. There is an exaltation for Him. And that's when people scatter under the weight of their own destruction, from their own failure, from the consequences that they created for themselves, the self-destructive behavior that I explained in the previous verses in chapter 1. Alright? Now, notice also here, it says the land is filled with silver, gold, chariots, horses, all that. Where do all these things come from? I mean, don't you remember chapter 1 when he's talking about, you know, the, 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 the judges accepting bribes and, and the, the widows and the fatherless, you know, there's no justice for them. I mean, where's all this stuff coming from? Well, that's the point, is that it's there. It just hasn't been, uh, it's just not owned by everyone. Right? There's a division in the society between those who have and those who have not. Right? There's, there's a division between the two. Now, you could suggest it's because of the fraud and the theft that has occurred, and I believe that that can be true to a certain degree, but not as much as people want to claim. You know, there's a belief that, that the reason why there's this separation, there's this class system in society where you have the upper class who's got the, the horses and the chariots and the lower class who's just trying to get through the day. You know, there's a belief that, you know, if we just reshuffle things, you know, just take from the wealthy and give to the poor, then everything's going to work out just fine. And it's never worked that way. 
Right? It just it's never worked that way. There, there are a number of reasons why. But part of it, okay, part of the destruction is certainly caused by the fraud, but it's not the only reason. And the reason why people talk about the fraud and the theft so much is because they don't want to confess. One of the biggest reasons as to why they have no silver themselves, and they have no horses themselves, and no chariots themselves, is because they wouldn't do any work for themselves. All right. In general, that's that's the number one reason why the people didn't have, and other people did, is because they wouldn't do anything. All right. Now, not doing anything can be measured in various ways. There's a lot to be said about that. But that is a big consequence as to why people do not have and other people do have. is because those who do have, in many respects, they're the ones who worked for it or took the risk to establish a business, hired other people to help with the work. And they, returned, they received either the, 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 the profit or the loss, because a lot of businesses fail, like 88%, I think, 80, Six or eight eight percent fail, but that's you know that's another description as to why there's a there's a few who have and and, and a lot who have not because a lot failed, a few succeeded, and so you have a division that's created there just because of the risk that's employed. But with great risk, there can be great compensation, you know, and so you end up with this division because there are people who work and people who do not. Now there is another category that fits in there as well, and that's inheritance. That's true, that there are people who inherited their wealth. But you know, there's a, there's a segment of the, of the uh, inheritance class that is uh, never spoken of for some reason. So I'll speak of it now. And that is the segment of people who decide that they're just going to spend the inheritance. Right? Which is convenient. You know, they're, 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 it is normal. Eventually, in civilizations, Eventually, you get some generation of some kind who says, you know, my parents, grandparents, they've got a lot of wealth. I think I'm just going to just kind of, you know, um, get by until they die. And then I'll retire on their inheritance, you know, on, on what they on what they what they they didn't spend themselves. So I'll spend it. They won't do it. I'll do it. And when a person or a generation takes a position such as that, then the following generation after them are really going to be in trouble because they're not going to be able to compete with the few people who didn't take that position because there's another way to view an inheritance. And that is that you leave a greater inheritance behind than what you received. If you do that, then your children who follow you will have a much greater advantage over the children of your neighbors who consumed it rather than using it in order to build more. You know, the one who is truly worthy of an inheritance is the one who can build one that they don't have. And then they will take the one that they receive and they will build more with that. But because there are so few people who will actually do that, you eventually create a society between the haves and the haves-nots because those who once had consumed until they no longer had and then they could not compete with those who did have and it became very, very challenging in order to reconstruct uh, a, new, uh, a new dynasty of some kind. All right, so it's not just a matter of the fraud and the theft, which does exist. It's also a matter of the people refusing to take responsibility for themselves and refusing to do the work for themselves. Remember uh, what I told you about the fatherless and the fact that they uh, were easy victims because they didn't have the resources to be able to even go to court. The same with the widow. They didn't have the resources to be able to defend themselves and to resolve conflicts. They, they, they were easy victims because uh, the others would have the ability to bribe, you know, for example, things like things such as that. But when you have a large number of people who live in a righteous way according to the law, to the extent that they can, not in order to be righteous before God, but in order to be responsible for themselves, right? I'm speaking in a fleshly sense at that point. Because there is, there is legitimacy there. Just don't try to claim something before God and say that He owes you a blessing because you did. You're going to be in real trouble there. 
right? But, but you can actually live according to the principles that are there in order to produce more than what you consume, and you can actually uh, build something according to the flesh. When you have a large number, or a, a large percentage of a population that's doing that, what happens when somebody commits fraud, or somebody bribes a judge? Then those people will identify that person, and they won't do business with that person anymore. They won't have to because their neighbors, or others who they know, can compete with the one who, uh, who is dishonest. But when you don't have a large percentage of people who are, ta who, you know, who, who, <clears throat> who are developing their own wealth and who, who are developing uh, their own self-sustainability, you end up being dependent on those who have a lot to be, to be dependent on them, which makes you an easy target and an easy victim for future fraud and future theft. So there is a, an element of fraud and theft that's true, but it's not nearly as big as the failure of the individual people to do something themselves, to actually do something. It's not, it's not as big as that. It's just big because everybody talks about it. And everybody tries to make it the issue, but it really isn't. And that's what he's getting into here, but you won't spot it. You won't spot it very easily unless you know the pronouns that are being used. And so I'll go to my translation that I've written where I've used the correct pronouns in order to help you identify these things. And I'll begin in verse 7. This is Isaiah chapter 2, verse 7. It says, And his land is full of silver and gold, and there is no end to his treasures. And his land is full of horses, and there is no end to his chariots. All right? Now, you got to be careful with this. Let's try to get our proper frame of reference for the 8th century B.C. kingdom of Judah that's being divided in this abstract context between Jacob and the Philistines. Now, let's try to get refocused. Refocused on 8th century B.C., House of Jacob and the Philistines, which is the kingdom of Judah. In this case, he's talking about the Jews who are there, those who are living reasonably to the, to the degree that they can according to the law are the house of Jacob, those who are not but are still legitimate Jews and have a right to be there in the kingdom, are the Philistines. In this case, this is the context. And he's using the pronoun his. And this, this refers back to the house of Jacob. Right? So he's making a division between the house of Jacob and the Philistines, those who are somewhat observing the law, those who are not. Those who are, are the ones who can declare that they are to a certain degree because of the silver, the horses, the chariots, the land excluding those who, do, who, who acquired those things by fraud, right? Okay, but not everybody was. There was still a minority, maybe the 1%, okay, we could, you know, something to that effect, that have these things. And I want you to know that he uses the word his instead of theirs or them, as it says in the uh, translation that I read earlier in the New King James. It doesn't say they or them. It says his in order to make a division between the people. Right, so they have the uh, they have the silver and the gold. There's no end to the treasures. Uh, it's it, they don't necessarily they're not necessarily uh, uh, compiling or storing the debased currency or the debased alcohol that uh, I mentioned in previous in the previous uh, verses from chapter one. Uh, that they they probably have uh, some good material here, good resources to work with uh, to give you a better understanding. The silver and the gold is not, is not used in order to just spend. That's, that's not how it's, how it's used. You don't measure the wealth of the silver and gold by, uh, by what you can spend. All right, let me give you an example. Uh, uh, today, right? Today, if you look at uh, big agriculture, uh, huge uh, uh, corporations doing major agricultural production, you probably notice it's very difficult to compete with them because you can't get into the capital investment like they can because you can't afford the machinery. You know, they, they use incredibly uh, expensive uh, machines. 
Uh, they use huge tracts of land. Uh, but you know, it turns out that over the last 10 years, there's been an evolutionary uh, recognition you know, I hate to use that term, but it's, it's evolutionary to it in a certain abstraction, that there are people who are getting into something called micro-farming. Okay, micro-farming, and that, uh, that is uh, generally farming on really small acreage. Uh, recently, I, heard, I, I listened to an interview of somebody who's using one and a half acres. One and a half acres, and uh, they have to hire two people to help them with the labor, and they end up uh, with a, uh, with, they end up with a net of uh, $100,000 approximately per year for two people, that would be the husband and the wife. $100,000 a year. In our current you know, scheme of things, uh, that would be considered to be twice the amount of the average pay that a person receives in the United States. Twice the amount, double the, the amount, just on one and a half acres using micro-farming te techniques and technology and it's all done with hand tools. No machinery at all. All right? Uh, that's what I mean, is that people uh, you know, don't have much vision when it comes to what it takes in order to accomplish things. But let me describe it this way. If you try to get into the big agricultural experience, you're going to need a lot of gold. Right? A lot of gold. But if you try the micro approach, you don't need as much gold. But you will need some. All right, You will need some. And uh, after doing an analysis of what it took for this particular example, it took $40,000 worth of gold right, uh, in order to have the capital investment to acquire, eventually, $100,000 per year. So what do you do? You take $40,000 worth of gold, you use it to earn $100,000, you buy back your $40,000 worth of gold, and you put it aside, and you use the other $60,000 in order to continue the development of life. And that's what the value of the silver and the gold is. It's not so that you can just go out and spend and consume. It gives you the capital resources to produce. To produce. To do something. To be productive so that you can continue the development of life. That's where its value is. And if it's $40,000 for one ounce of gold, or it's $40 for an ounce of gold, it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter what the price is. It matters how you use it. All right? It doesn't matter what the price is. It matters on how you utilize it. And, uh, and that's what makes the difference when it comes to the development of these things. So when they say that the land is full of silver and gold, it tells you that the person does not have this great capacity to spend. It tells you that these are the people who have the great capacity to capitalize their labor so that they can produce. That's the wealth. The wealth is the ability to work. Oh, evil! Evil! We don't want to work! But give me a job! Right? Okay, I mean, that's what people are doing. And this is what was going on back then. It's no different, all right? So they have that. They have the, uh, the land is full of horses. There is no end to his chariots. What's the value of the horses and the chariots? Transportation. Okay, all civilization is defined in three different categories. It's defined in the context of storage, transportation, and production. That's it. Storage, transportation, and production. You know, and this, this can, can, be, can be carried over into every form of life. You know, I used to teach theoretical computer science, but on occasion I teach some basic computer science. And I always start my basic courses out saying that computer programming is nothing more than the storage and the transportation and the computation of data. That's it. Whether you're using horses, or electrical cable lines, it doesn't matter. It's still the transportation of things. When it comes to production, you know, when, so you're, you're going to take the ore uh, out of land and transport it on the chariot with the horse so that you can get it to the refinery so that it can be manufactured uh, in, in, or refined into something else and then, and then turned into something else from there. That's productive capacity. 
or you transport the data into a storage location in your computer and then you do production on it through analysis using mathematical techniques in order to produce intelligent information that then can be used in order to make decisions to solve other kinds of problems. Right? It's the same thing. It always gets boiled down to that. And so whether they've got the horse, the chariot, or you've got the car, or the truck, or the trailer, it, it, it's the same thing. Okay, the same thing, transportation. Uh, and there is no end to his chariots. They've got plenty of transportation. Okay, then in verse 8, and his land is filled with worthless idols. Right, I love this. With worthless idols. Does that mean that they have um, you know, some figurine or something on, on their bookshelf? No, it could be anything. It could be anything that people worship in terms of what they believe will give them a sense of completeness in their lives. Anything, right? That's what I talked about when I talked about the previous verse where in chapter, chapter 1 where there is no completeness in anyone. Remember that? I think it's chapter 1, verses 6, 7 in that ballpark. There is no completeness in anyone regardless of what idol they may assume is going to give them some sense of completeness. Even the gold can become an idol, even though you don't fashion it into you know, an actual figurine of some kind. It still, in and of itself, can become an idol. Having the ability to produce can be an idol, can be a source of pride. I mentioned this earlier. Right? Having the ability to produce can be a source of pride. Not producing can be the result of pride. You know, I'm not going to take that job. But, you know, I'm worth more than that. Maybe you are, but the job isn't. <laughs> okay. You know, it's, these are the idols that people struggle with, whether they have or they have not. There are plenty of idols to go around for everyone, even for those who have an abundance of the resources for production. Right? But even, even for those... They can have their idols, and his land is filled with worthless idols. His horse can become an idol. The chariot can become an idol. <clears throat> a replacement for God. They will bow down to the work of his hands to worship what they made with his fingers. This is, this is just fantastic. This just says so much. Let me read again from the New King James where you can see what you're missing. All right. What's not here? In verse 8, the land, their land, is full of idols. They worship the work of their own hands, that which their own fingers have made. All right? Now, this is true. It's true. Like I said, people will worship the things that they made because those things can be a replacement for God, can be replacement in the sense that they can now have pride because they have produced when somebody has not. They can compare themselves with somebody else. You get a sense of pride from that, arrogance from that, because of what you have accomplished. There is uh, there's an idol in the sense that you now have purpose. Uh, you now have justification for people to accept you. And when a person pursues love and acceptance and meaning and purpose outside of their relationship with God, they have committed sin. They have committed idolatry. Right? But you have to know the New Covenant to be able to grapple with that one, right? I mean, you just, there's no way to know that that is a form of idolatry until you know that <clears throat> that, uh, that that is what the Lord saved us for so that we could receive His love and acceptance and meaning and purpose to meet the deepest needs of our hearts. But when we pursue that in the world through either our successes or our failures, then we are committing idolatry in that abstraction. These people would hear this and they wouldn't get the fullness of this. They, wouldn't ca they couldn't capture this. But when you have the Holy Spirit dwelling within you to meet the need deepest needs of your heart according to the forgiveness of sins and everything, you can see this in a way that they could not. So, yes, it is true that a person can achieve these things from what they personally experience. But the pronouns are not properly translated so you don't catch that there are some people who are esteeming pride from what others have done and are trying to lay claim on what somebody else has accomplished, which is definitely a description of um, you're in real trouble in your society when you reach this point. I mean, you know you are definitely close to the bottom 
Not when people esteem pride for what they have done for themselves, but when they esteem pride from what somebody else has done. When you lay claim on somebody else's labor, you know your civilization is in trouble. When you say something like, you got a business? You didn't build that. <laughs> All right, you know, our king, so to speak, <laughs> openly said that recently. I hate to date this you know, recording. He said that openly. You got a business? You, 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 you didn't build that. Your workers built that. Or because of the infrastructure that we produce for you to utilize, that's the only reason why you've got that. You know, yeah, you may have had to go back to the horse and chariot like every, you know, like everybody else would have to if they don't have roads. I mean, you know, this is this is a description of um, serious, serious uh, uh, problems. When somebody lays claim to somebody else's work and says that is mine, then you know you are really at the at the at the, at the end of your society. The end is soon approaching very soon approaching, and that's what they say here. In verse 8, the translation that I produce, I show you this with the pronouns, uh, again, uh, in verse 8, and his land is filled with worthless idols. They will bow down to the work of his hands. They. In a way, it's, it's a way of saying they, the Philistines, will bow down to the work of the house of Jacob. Not because he created some golden calf that they worship as an idol. But they will bow down. They will worship the work that he has done in the sense of dependency. Because he's the only one who has anything to give. This is the only one who has food to provide. They will worship the one who can give them the food that they cannot or will not produce for themselves. They will begin to worship the one who has the horse that will provide them with the transportation that they do not have for themselves. They will bow down to that person. They may be fortunate uh, if he decides to deploy some of his gold in order to capitalize work that he will give for them to do. They will bow down to him, their master, their employer. You get it? That's the difference between him, his, and they. That it is they who will have no alternative but to live at the mercy of someone else who will give them a job because they either won't produce their own or they don't have the capital resources to produce their own. And that is the separation in a society between those who have and those who have not. What will they get for their employment? Whatever the job is worth. All right, whatever the job is worth. Not whatever they are worth, whatever the job is worth. So, uh, in verse, uh, in, you know, th there's a place for all of those, all, all of those things. You know, there's a place. But, uh, but please uh, try to get an understanding of what it means to say, they will bow down to the work of his hands, as you will see, that there will be in every civilization at its, at its, at its uh, end, at the time of its end, there will be a separation between the haves and the have-nots, and the have-nots will be the ones who bow down to the ones who have as servants. Uh, continuing on, to worship what they made with his fingers. Now, you, you, you hear that. To worship what they made with his fingers. And you got to think, you know, that translation just doesn't make any sense. I mean, if you don't understand these things, you, can't, you just can't translate it that way. you got to say what he made with, with his fingers or what they made with their fingers. But you can't say what they made with his fingers. I mean, it's just, you can't put that together. I mean, how can they make using his finger. I mean, it's his finger. He decides what he's going to make or not. All right? That, this, is, this is the deal. You have heard people lay claim to someone else's property. You have a business. You didn't build that business. That's not your business. You got horses in that business or trucks in that business. Those are not yours. 
You got gold in that business, just not yours. We'll take some of it. You've got a machinery in that business, it's not yours. You've got customers in that business, they're not yours. All right, that's what it says. What they made through his fingers is the proclamation of the sinful person who won't work for themselves and are so desperate that they will claim ownership of somebody else's property and of somebody else's labor, somebody else's fingers. And how long do you think the one who has is going to use his fingers so that somebody else can claim what he produces? How long will that go on? Not long. The day will come when the business will just simply close. When the owner will just simply pack up and leave. When the commercial buildings will be boarded up and they'll put a for sale sign in front. You know, you've noticed in our recent times they went from for rent to for sale to for auction. You've been noticing that? All right? And the businesses are gone. And the factories are gone. They're not even museums anymore. Because there is no way that a person is going to work with their fingers when some other they takes what they produce. So this statement is well placed. And the pronouns his and they should be properly translated. And so you can see just how bad things are. That the Philistines are claiming rights over the labor of the house of Jacob. And at that point, uh, things are not looking good at all. It is not a sustainable model. It is not a sustainable model at all. And so eventually, there will be a, a, a takedown. All right, a huge takedown. In verse 9, and man of earthly origin has been brought down low, and man, an heir of cor corruption and weakness, has been humbled. Now, I give a better, a, a, a more comprehensive explanation for that. If that's too much for you to handle, go up to the verse by, uh, I'm sorry, the word for word translation to verse 9. And man has been brought down low, and man has been humbled. You can just go there uh, and not get the further explanation. The reason why there's a further explanation there is because he uses two different words for man, and so I give a definition for each word. That's, that's why I have that in the thought for thought, a definition for the, each word that he chose to use. Uh, for the sake of time, I'm not going to, uh, to get into the details concerning those things and say, at the end of verse 9, you will not lift them up. All right, so he's not going to lift anybody up. In the New King James, it said they will not be forgiven, which is okay, but I think that uh, there would be another word that was, would be used in the event that he wanted to say forgiveness, in my opinion. Uh, I think just saying lifted up would be adequate um, because it does give a broader description concerning the fact that God is not going to intervene. He's not going to do anything. He's going to just simply let this happen. This is the way you want to do it? You do it. Self-destructive? Yes. He'll allow for that. But remember, from chapter 1, He will eventually intervene to obtain a remnant before everything is lost. He will at least do that. That's what He said from chapter 1. So He's not going to intervene on this destruction that people are causing to themselves. In verse 10, Go into the rock and hide as you would bury treasure in the dust from before the dread of Hashem and from the splendor of His majesty. Where does this come from? Have you not had the thought that if things get so bad, you're just going to flee to the mountains? Right? I mean, you, you think that. I mean, you end up thinking things like that at some point. When you see what, you have a vision of what's ahead of you, and you see that, that there, are, there is an abundance of people who are claiming ownership over the few people who have something, you know it's not going to be long. All right? It's not going to be long before they run out of what the other people have. And then who are they, who are they going to go after next? Right? And if you have nothing, it doesn't mean they're not going to come after you anyway. 
And you start thinking in these terms. You think, you know, I just got to flee. And in some cases, that may just be the option. All right, but he says you just run to the rocks. You know what? And then his glory will be manifested. His splendor will be seen. Because while you're out there in the rocks, contemplating while you're there amongst the rocks, and you start getting hungry, and after three weeks you start thinking about going back to town, right? when, that's, when you start contemplating those things, you will start to realize that it's because people sin. It's because people sin. Because they fail to live in observance to the law. Even though they tried, they tried eventually, generation, eventually, generationally speaking, there was a turning away from that, and until people will return to the law of God and begin to reconstruct life according to the flesh, there will be no hope. There still will, but won't be any hope in the spirit, but at least that's a way of sustaining the flesh a little while until the decay happens once again. And so it shows through the repetition of the rise and fall, the rise and fall, the rise and fall, that it's not working. I mean, is that how you want to live? Rising and falling, rising? Where's the peace in that? There's no peace in that. There's no joy in that. You know, you think you do all this work in order to create a dynasty for your generations in the future, knowing that eventually some generation, fourth, fifth, sixth, who knows when, eventually they're just going to say, ah, let's just spend it. And you can get depressed over that. <laughs> all right? You can. The rising and fall, there is still no peace. There is no completeness. That's no excuse not to do that, which is right anyway. But there will be no peace, there will be no completeness in any of this. And through the revelation of the rising and falling, of the success and failure, through the revelation of that, uh, you will see the splendor of His majesty. In verse 11, the eyes of the arrogance of a man will be humbled, and the pride of men will be brought down low. Why? Because they will recognize that they've run out of people to steal from, and also they will realize that even though they may produce an abundance, it's easy for it to just be stolen. So either way, with whatever uh, class they are in, upper or lower, producers or consumers, regardless of where they fit, their pride will be taken down. They will be taken down, and they will see that there is nothing outside of the mercy of God. And Hashem will be exalted for Himself in that day. That will be the point of exaltation. And that people will finally see Him for who He is and see that there is no hope outside of His grace and mercy. Which is the point. That's the point. That's the purpose of this. So that people will finally see Him for who He is and turn to Him for who He is and receive what He has. Now, if you embrace Him for who He is and you live in what He has and what He gives, then it doesn't matter what stage you are in in your life. If you're at the time of the rise of the civilization or you are at the time of the fall of civilization, it won't matter. You can still navigate through it with peace and joy that you have with Him. Whether you produce a lot or you produce little, you will still have peace with your God. Those, those measurements that people use, whether you have many horses or none, whether you have many chariots or none, whether you have a lot of gold or none, you can still have peace with your God. He will be exalted in that day when we see Him for who He is, us for who we are, and we live in the inheritance that He gives us in Christ Jesus instead of the inheritance that we think that we may receive or that which we may build. And that's the exaltation that He's looking for. That's what He's really looking for. And so rest in Him. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank You for this time that we can review the Scriptures and we can see Your testimony to us concerning these matters. Lord, I, I pray that we will take this to heart and that we will 
uh, live in the peace that you've called us to live in. And I thank you for this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.